Hey everybody, do you want to make a D&D podcast like us? Or really, any podcast? Well then you gotta know about Anchor. First off, my favorite part, it's very free. It's the most free. It costs no dollars. That's sick. Second part, you can start monetizing with their monetization tools immediately with no minimum listenership. Also very sick. You can... Now, this is new, you can take any song from Spotify and add it directly into your episodes, and let me tell you, that's freaking sick nasty. So, download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started today. Welcome to Campaign 4 of Lawful Stupid, where I'm joined with Uncle Shainsaw. Say hi, Uncle Shainsaw. Hello. So, we've done two other one-shots. However, you're probably going to hear this out of order. Or in the order I chose. So, enjoy. That said, Shane. Welcome back. Under my domain. I'm excited. I love it. Same. Good. So, what I would like you to do, Shane, before we kick off this wonderful adventure down the uh, backstory of your character... Just tell me about your character. Give a give a physical description of, of the important parts that you care about for people to know. Uh, his his race, his class, and level for me, please. Uh, and talk about your sure. class specifically because that's a little different. Yeah, I got you. Uh, so this is my sweet sweet boy, uh, Gustum Derringer. He is a, uh, what he is a, I'm sorry, why can't I think of what the name of it is? A wild hunt shifter. Uh, he's a large panda man. Uh, he is a custom subclass that I've had for a while now uh, called the Circle of the Twice Baked, uh, which is a, a subclass coming from the Twice Baked Soul, the kind of Blue Magic cooking based uh, subclass series, I guess. I've, I've made a few of them now yep. um, for, for a few of the primary classes, but he is a, a druid. Um, some of the special things about him is that uh, he is kind of like a blue magic class, so he will be collecting like monster bits throughout the campaign and he will be cooking with them. He is a, an accomplished chef, uh, and as he eats these magical meals that he creates, he's going to be able to uh, get some some powers from those creatures, kind of mimicking their uh, their abilities and their strengths. So, very fun times for me. And, uh, so, class and level, did we say that? Yeah, so... so- yeah, so he is a uh, a circle of the twice baked druid. He is level three. Uh, he to describe him, he's like a big old fella. He's six four, two hundred and seventy ish pounds. Uh, looks like a a large panda like man. He's got those those dark circles around his eyes, and he's got little black ears amongst his white hair, and kind of long sideburns that come down. Kind of a a, a big bearish man uh, dressed in chef's garb. So just really simple. Um, uh, kind of hemp and linen uh, clothes with like a like a little white uh, towel cloth tied around his waist. Um, he has a large pack on him almost at all times. It's just filled to the brim with with various cooking equipment hanging with like pots and pans and and whatnot hanging off of it. Uh, and that's kind of his his traveling gear. His general vibe. I love it. I'm excited. I love the blue magic element. I love the twice baked soul. I've been alongside it a few times now, so I'm pretty excited to uh, to help you enjoy it some more. Never done it in a long form campaign like this before. I've done it for like a one shot. I've done it. This is going to be really, really cool to see it play out. Kind of maybe tweak and refine it and play test it a little bit as we go. I, for one, am very excited, especially in the setting we're going to be in campaign four. Mm-hmm. So. If you're ready, sir? I am, sir. Well, let me take you on an adventure then.
<clears throat> we cut to the visage of Declan Derringer, a man covered in warm furs, his brown fedora-style hat sticking atop this this mountain of, of clothes and, and, and outer garments. The snowscape of silence in the distance. Declan, surrounded by the, the, the fall of snow, cold, his footsteps crunch. The opposite side of him, a small bear cub, limping and whining. <laughs> Declan makes note that the bear cub has panda-like markings around its eyes. And he says, It's okay, little one. I can help you. You look hurt. Does the bear cub trust him? No, he's very standoffish and defensive. He continues uh, to growl weakly. So Declan pulls from his pack like uh, what could only be described as like um, jerky, like rationed jerky and like offers it to the bear cub. It's fine. I, I can help you. You seem wounded. He is going to kind of like very weakly, almost limping, come up kind of <laughs> sniffing hesitantly as he approaches his hand and grabs the jerky and runs away. <laughs> and uh, Declan says, Don't worry, little one. I can help you find your mother. He kind of just whines softly. <laughs> so Declan kind of waves and like. starts walking to try and see if the, the bear will follow. He's going to scarf that jerky down, and then I think that... Uh, being in this kind of barren snow, eventually he would kind of just like see if there's any more food to be be had and follow him. I can see Declan like looking at his, not much of his rations left and just still sparingly dropping some occasionally to keep the bear interested. For sure, yeah, that would keep him in tow. So Declan, he came out here for a mission. He came out here for adventure, and he's going to continue that as well. And so he follows these tracks that he's been hunting. And these are large footprints. They are, like his feet are swallowed. When he steps in them, it is much larger than his legs. And it doesn't take long for Declan to find uh, a scene, a a scenery, uh, almost what he was afraid of. While Declan didn't mention to the bear, he was out here hunting fiends. And not to fight them, that's not Declan's style, but ideally to track where they were coming from. And to Declan's surprise, as he follows these tracks, him and the bear come upon a scene of what can only be described as horror. Collapsed tents, bodies partially covered in snow, the smell of death on the wind. Declan turns back to this little bear cub and kind of opens his palm and ushers the bear to stay. Stay here, little one. I think the the bear probably knows this place. Um, and like, maybe trudges ahead of Declan uh, and he comes to these kind of two unidentifiable forms in the snow and kind of like just curls up in a ball between them. Uh, Declan at first doesn't chase the bear. Like, that's not his prerogative. He, he surveys the scene and you hear him say, mm-hmm. that's not good. That's a lot of blood. <sighs> Whoever did this that's a circle of binding. And then he walks over um, towards the cub, and as he does so, he says, Oh no. These poor druids. They gave their life to put that thing away. 
and he not one of the two that the the cub is circled up with. There's a nearby one. He he leans down and kind of helps close these eyes that were just frozen open. And so he he walks over to the cub and and kind of puts together the druidic nature and and potentially has this idea. He kneels down near the cub very slowly. You can like slowly hear the the, the almost heartbreaking crunch of snow as as Declan leans nearby and says, "Is this your circle?" I I think that the, the cold has been wearing on this cub for a long time now, and as he's laid up here in the snow, his breathing is becoming more and more ragged and. Uh, is, 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 in a, is in a real bad way. Declan gets closer, noticing the bear is not reacting, and just kind of uh, gives him a pet. Can you, can you hear me? And I think with that, there's like a shiver from the cub, and as the cold just finally eats away at him and He kind of just shivers and breathes this ragged breath. He collapses and transforms into the shape of a a small boy uh, with these still panda-like characteristics uh, covered in just sparse rags, uh, just face down unconscious in the snow. Declan quickly takes off his outer garments and, and wraps the boy up. You've been out here all alone. Declan takes a look back at the camp, surveying the damage and, and also the time that this boy must have been out here alone. How long have you been out here? How long have you hid away in that bestial form? Declan like looks down at this small child. It's no matter. I've got you now. Declan takes the boy in and he scoops him into his arm and he begins to march back towards his own camp. We won't forget your family, little one. But we will give you another heart to lay your head off. Time passes as time dies. Suns rise. Suns fall. Moons shine. Moons wane. We see images of Declan training Gus, using small berries as rewards for doing simple tasks. Declan pats Gustum's wild hair and hands him a small berry. Good job staying in your mortal form. You don't need the safety of that bear anymore. And we see more images still of, of Declan training Gustum on very normal things like staying in the, his boy form, learning to shake hands. And as the years begin to pile on, this small boy begins to grow up and out. And we see Declan say, there's a chocolate covered berry in it for you. If you can tell me which greeting is best when introducing oneself. Uh, hello, I'm Gustum. Not bad, good start. And he hands you a chocolate berry. Oh. <laughs> Time marches on. And we see Gus. We see, excuse me. We see Gustum grow a few years more. Now a teen, and Declan and Gustum are working together. S- still some more training, and we see Declan say, 
Kato found some lemon chocolate bars while at the market today. Whoa! You can have one as soon as you transform into a bear and then a timber wolf. Without the panda markings. Oh, <laughs> bummer. Okay, alright, alright, here we go, here we go. <clears throat> and I think he tries. Uh, that is actually outside of my area of expertise. I cannot become a bear. Uh, so I think that, um, not like the, a, a full grown bear, I think that. I, he goes like bear cub instinctually, and he's just kind of this weird looking like he's got one under mark of a panda eye, but the other one's clear and there's nothing on top. And he's like, uh? And you and you see Declan toss this uh, lemon chocolate bar. Scoops it up off the ground. Goes, okay, and now a wolf, right? Correct. I can do this one. All right, here we go. <clears throat> <laughs> I don't know what that sounds like. It's not really hard. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's uh, that's how I transform. Yeah, uh, no, 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 he tosses the lemon bar. No, he turns into like uh, a, a wolf, just like a, a regular wolf, not a temper wolf particularly, but just a wolf. And then uh, Declan walks over and kneels. I guess not kneels. The wolf's pretty tall. Uh, just rubs the wolf's snout and hands another. Uh, lemon chocolate bar over. Scrum, 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 scrum. <laughs> ah, good job. And then we see the visage of... We see time pass. We see the scene change. And we see the visage of Gus laying around as a small cat with the, the white and black coloring around the eyes. The almost panda-esque. And you hear Declan say, Come, Gus. I need you to go on an errand with Kato. <sighs> Do I have to? Uh, I figured as much, but this one is different. Declan waves around a chef spoon. I've got someone for you to meet. Her name is Trifle. Have you heard of her? The Trifle? The, the world-renowned chef? Yeah, I've heard of Trifle. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've pulled some strings, and she will be mentoring you for a while. You can travel with her and learn to cook and learn the world from her. Are you Siri Dog? <laughs> it's imperative to me that you learn to survive on your own, Gustum. I won't always be around to protect you, and neither will Kato. Well, okay, yeah, I'm totally... When do we go? Excellent. We'll be leaving first thing in the morning. Well, go on. Go pack your things. Oh, yeah! <laughs> and so the next morning comes, and, and Declan is greeting uh, greeting Gustum as he's preparing to leave. And I got my shoes all tied up. I got my back. Do, 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 do. And Gustum. Yeah. I need you to remember the trifle is serious in nature and you're not you're aloof often and that's not wrong but it's important to find a balance in all things okay yeah sometimes you gotta eat your vegetables and I get it you're not hearing a word because you're so excited about I'm gonna trend. cook so much stuff <laughs> With my best friend Trifle, uh, my new mom. I'm I'm very <laughs> proud of you, Gustum. <laughs> Thank you. And always remember, if you're ever lost, go hearthbound. And he hands you a necklace with golden coin on it. This coin is made up Whoa. of two rings. The main coin with the Derringer family crest, which is like it's a diamond, but then there's a diamond to every point, and there's a small line connecting them. And the second thin outer ring is plain except for one arrow pointing away from the crest. And this outer ring on this amulet spins freely. Fidget spinner dog? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, don't, don't annoy Trifle. This is a favor for me. 
and so we flash through uh, so many more memories. But let's start with the first. I imagine, I imagine Trifle has Trifle is a traveling chef and has her own um, wagon and 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 her and because she's renowned, it is large. It is pulled by two large stallions. And while that is her place to cook, sometimes she cooks at ends, red roof ends, and mainly because then they don't charge her anything. And then she gets to sell her profit. So you're at a red roof inn, and she's trying to teach you uh, to cook. What me- What is the first meal that comes to mind for Gustin? I think that Trifle wants to get a really accurate read on this kid's skill and so i think she's going to give him something really tough to start with so what she's going to have him do is try to create a dish that they call um the okra the okra orchestra which is a okra focused dish uh, made from various uh different uh, roots and vegetables and each one has a different specific cooking point but when they're cooked perfectly al dente, it will emit just like a beautiful singular note. And when you get all the ingredients together, they kind of come together and make this this beautiful harmony. Are you describing cooking using musical terms? Is that your plan for the whole campaign? Not the whole campaign. Just okay, this cool. one dish. Just this they're one. all magical just, and fanciful. Just checking. Just checking. Uh, yeah, t- describe that scene to me. Uh, you know, I think it is just, you know, trial and error and trial and error and trial and error. And I think we haven't, do you want to go through and describe trifle real quick? I think we don't think we've done that yet. Um, why don't you describe trifle? So trifle is a... Since that's really your baby. For sure. Trifle is a, uh, she appears to be a young woman, but she's a drow, and it's impossible to know her real age. She has a more mature demeanor and continence, so you think she's an older uh, drow woman. But she uh, is in very standard uh, chef's garb, so like what you would expect like a modern chef to be wearing. So like the big white hat, and then the, kind of the, the mandarin collar with the buttons, and the sleeves rolled up. Uh, and she is uh, currently... Uh, not always, but currently she is observing the uh, right of the silent suit. Uh, so currently no speaking for Trifle. Uh, they believe that uh, the tongue's one true purpose in life is to taste, and uh, they can get a, a richer and deeper taste from what they eat by, by not speaking. So she is currently observing that vow. So um, that is kind of, there's, there's like a language barrier, I think. So what we see in this scene is just um, the same thing over and over again of Gus coming up with these dishes and then them being slightly, in this case, literally out of key. There's like a discordant note. Something's not perfect and it doesn't sound beautiful. So he'll present it to her. She takes a look, listens, shakes her head, tosses it in the trash. And then just you'll again. see, you see when she does that, and she gives her that stern, gives a stern look, and tosses it in the trash with very simple motion of the finger. She just swirls her finger, almost as I do it again, like once more. And and we see this flash of imagery back and forth as Gus goes on to make uh, this okra orchestra multiple times. Um, wasting food by like a commoner's uh, assessment of like oh no no. I I take that back I I forgot that I did write something in for that because I was like I don't want to waste food Uh, I think Trifle has like a a pet or something that's like a that's like just like eats it all like she just tosses it to this creature I don't know what that would be but do you want is that yeah no uh, no absolutely (laughs) we we absolutely discussed that And that's my bust for saying that her wagon was pulled by these stallions. That was my bad. She's actually got Hecre, which if you remember... That's what it was. They're horse-esque animals, and they will eat pretty much anything. Yeah, Um, so she's tossing the spoils to the Hecre, and that's what they eat. So so it's not waste. We're not wasting food, anybody. Not even fantasy food. (laughs) Not even fantasy food. Uh, And so, and we see the, we see it go and go and go, and I think to Gustav's dismay, still couldn't get it perfect. But, you know, Trifle has a much better understanding of 
where Gustum begins. And right, and I think this is like an expert level dish. This is like yeah, it is a hundred percent like a five star yeah, yeah. Michelin restaurant right. assessment. It is you don't throw something where you have to time everything perfectly and a bunch of roots and vegetables because that shit's hard. And that she just wanted to see Gustum swerve and attempt yeah. and try and see where. And so and and so Gustum and Trifle travel together and Trifle is famous so she's doing a lot of appearances she goes to towns and they're excited they give her stuff and she sells her food and months of this go by before Trifle really gives uh, Gustum another test. What is the second dish that Trifle throws at Gustum to really push? Uh, I think what it's going to be is a um it is going to be what they call schooner delight. And what that is, it's like uh, you have to fashion like a large bowl and you fill it with this delicious like pudding. And then you construct like a ship made out of cookies, like bis- a biscuit like substance. And then the ship, fl- and, and the idea is that if, if you construct everything correctly, you can spin kind of like the outer bowl and the little ship will go and like sail around in a circle in the pudding. That is a very uh, unique dessert. And so you guys do. Uh, and it is a lot of, uh, it, with it being a pudding, a lot of like cooking pots, like heating it up and then mm-hmm. cooling it down, heating it up and like cooling it down. And I think, same deal. I think with it being pudding, it's different, right? I don't think she, like as, as you make this creation and you spin the bowl and you, and you start to see like the ship go and then it just veers into the center and just stops moving. She doesn't feed it to the Hecker. Instead, being a, a renowned chef, she uses her own extra dimensional space and puts them into these um, almost like cups um, and puts them into the extra dimensional space to keep safe for orphans when you guys go between towns. Because nice. it's one thing just to give these Heckers a shit ton of vegetables and meat. Yeah, it's yeah. another to fill them up with chocolate. For and sure. so you do that and there's almost a heartbreak every time you finish and spin the bowl and watch it fail and her shake her head, spin her finger and and not only the failure alone, but then you then watch your mentor pull the bowl, pour it into cups and store it away. One thing we love at Lawful Stupid among the other things we love at Lawful Stupid is spreading the word about your business. Or maybe you want to tell your sweet, sweet grandma that you love her for the world to hear. We want to give you that chance. If you're a business and want to get your services on the air, or just want to tell a loved one a personal message, head on over to lawfulstupid.org forward slash message in a bottle. There you can take around 250 words to say what you want. Business ads are $20. Personal ads are 10 Tell the world what you have to hear with Lawful Stupid's message in a bottle. Time passes. More and more months go by, and I would say even a year or so, as you guys continue to travel. And I think your travels with her are not just continent-based. I think you travel between continents, which means boarding uh, Trifle's traveling kitchen onto ships and then moving across the oceans. I think I think you're in Yuri at some point and you're trying to learn your next dish or she's trying to test you once more, one once more. Uh, and I, maybe a year's not enough. Is it a year? Is it two years, Shane? What, how long before a third solid test do you think trifle weight? So it, it's, 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 it's worth noting that between these big tests, Gus, it's not just all failure for Gus. It's not like he's never like, Correct. like she, she takes him back to basics and like here's bread and like here's a steak and you know she and, and he is he is learning and growing. But these are the big these big moments. Yes, these are the big tests. This whole time that you're traveling together, you are uh, her first chef. You're, right. you're you're cutting vegetables. She's teaching you bread. She's uh, I think on your off days she's remind like okay list. Well, she can't talk, 
but she like points at a recipe and you know that you have to memorize it. Right. And she's going to ask you not only the ingredients, how you do it, and then she's always going to trip you up because if you just read it perfectly, she's not going to be happy. She wants to right. know what, what that recipe is missing. Right. So you, you come up to your third test. So in all of these, these things have been stacking up, these fundamentals, these failures and successes, right? It's a combination because it's not like Gus, I'm just failing this entire time. That's a good point to bring up. But it is a year, two years of accumulated I think, I think probably, experience. Yeah. What is the third dish? So another thing that, that we focus on just outside of cooking is just the acquiring of these ingredients because none of it's common and none of it's easy. Correct. And sometimes it's in that procurement it's in that 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 hunt that kill in, in which the real test is and so uh we're out here hunting uh, <clears throat> excuse me we're out in the wilderness hunting uh call them twilight fawns uh they are this uh quadrupedal uh very deer-like uh creature that only appear uh in the in the very wee hours of the morning um and if you can hunt one without it knowing that you are there, its meat has this amazing aroma that smells exactly like whatever your favorite smell is. But if they're startled, they release a chemical, an endorphin, that makes the meat just smell horrendous. So it's kind of like this. The test in its, of itself is to hunt. Uh, so we see, I think... Gustum as a uh, panda spotted timber wolf stalking through these woods and um, trying and at on more than one occasion failing uh, to get one of these twilight fawns without them. Roll me a stealth check. I would love to. And you can use your stats or you can use a wolf's stats. I will use the wolf's stats. Each test is totally based on each campaign, and I'm digging it. Uh, is a uh, 14. Okay. With a 14, <clears throat> I think I think uh, Gustum scares a couple before he's able to track down one 100% unheard, unstartled. Because that's, like you were saying, that's the sweetness of the meat of being totally unaware and at peace when life is taken and it has to be and like it, a, it has to be a clean kill like you can't it's gotta be a clean kill it's gonna like, be quick because so i think i think gustum does that and so i think this beautiful um this twilight fawn the smaller deer esque thing and i think their 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 fur is almost it's like so a standard deer is like brown. There's almost like this magenta hue that wafts off of it. And their horns instead it's of almost, being... Go ahead. Almost opalescent in the moonlight. Like it's almost got like a refractive quality to it. Yes. And I think their, <laughs> their antlers, instead of just being bone, they're a little more... almost. I would almost say crystal in nature, but that's not the right mm. word. They almost shine and are slightly translucent in the in the, the moonlight or the the early risings of of the, the sun. And so you're able to you're able to leap on it and just go for the So neck. what do you make out of Quick. that? Uh, yeah, so this is gonna be uh, we're gonna we're gonna do this up um, full smorgasbord style. We're going to do uh, the ribs up. We're going to do the shanks. We're going to do steaks. Uh, and then everything else is going to be processed for sausage and jerky. Um, but I mean, it's at this point, custom, uh, the, the, the real challenge with this was, was getting <clears throat> the meat in one piece. Uh, and he did that. So like his skill cooking meat is already there, I think. And um, I, th I think when you come back with a kill, um, and what is what is Gustum's favorite smell? I think 
Gustin's favorite at this point in his life. Um, it is like rich roasting chestnuts that he used to have back before he can remember. And so as you as you drag this prey back, um, the smell of rich roasting chestnuts is kind of wafting in the air and a master of aroma and taste. She, she picks up on it and she has this stern look on her face and you almost see just the corners of her of her, of her straight line face turned up for just half a second before she locks it back in. And for the first time in a long time and the first time ever on one of these bigger trials, she doesn't shake her head at you. And she doesn't spin her finger. How does that make Gustin feel? I think he's 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 like excited and ner- but he's like waiting for that bite. He's waiting for her to actually taste it and and acknowledge it. And success is what success is. And and Gustum Gustum's time with Trifle eventually comes to an end. And so time comes and time goes and years pass. Many meals come and go, but Gustum eventually begins traveling on his own under the twice baked soul banner. And as the years go by, we find ourselves in the small rustic village of Riverside. And as our view is filled with the Riverside, the village of Riverside, the sound of love fills our ears as we approach the sign of a, on a building that says two spoons is enough. We come into the scene of Gustum and who we would know May cooking very much in love. Shane, can you do me a favor and describe that? Describe May and describe the scene of them cooking and the happiness that the two of them have in the kitchen. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, May is uh, a a young half elf woman. She's got brunette hair with bangs, and it kind of tucks behind her her slightly pointed ears. Um, she's got a really warm smile, and she wears. Pretty, pretty. Some. What do you call those summer dresses? What do you call those? What do you call those? The summer. Summer dresses, dresses flower dresses. Uh, no, it's summer those? dresses. The, the, the summer ones dresses. that are a little loose and a little sheer. Yeah, I like the summer dresses. Yeah, those are summer dresses, my dude. Those sundress. Sun sun dress. Sun dress. Sun dresses. Yeah. Yeah. This is why so we have some sundress. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I knew she what you meant when you said summer dress. I was sundresses and all the and all the pretty prints and the pastels, and she smells like spring because I mean she, that's May. And that's she. She is the spring, uh, and that's and, and they're cooking together and they're having a great time. And May focuses on the mains, and uh, Gus focuses on the sides, and they have a, a meager and happy life together, where they're able to to cook their own food and feed the people they love. What meal are they cooking when we come in this time? I mean, it's a, it's a full spread, I think. So, you know, um, it's we're getting ready for that uh, dinner time rush. Uh, right now, uh, Gus is working on just like a, a hearty stew uh, and slipping in uh, more dragon chili flakes than they would probably like for him to do. <laughs> but uh, he gets a little bored with uh, the ingredients that are on hand. Uh, so he's got to spice it up a little bit. And then May is just... Uh, pulling out a, uh, a roast turkey in the oven, I think. Just a big, fat bird, just ready to go, just perfectly moist and rocking. And so before the dinner rush uh, comes open, I think the windows are open to kind of let the heat go out naturally. And uh, there's this little clockwork uh, bird that kind of floats in, and it's all over the place. Like You can tell that it has seen some things. It's got a bent wing, and it kind of comes in and crashes right down uh, onto your, like, not the stove, but your cooking area, probably through some of your food, and clutched in its hands are, as like this, like, beaten up and worn envelope. Whoa, what's the deal, little bro? What you got there for me? 
This is my character voice. This is what I sound like for the whole campaign, bro. It's too bad, dude. It's the whole time. My brothers in nature, what can I get started for you today? So this clockwork bird has a um, a worn envelope, and on the outside of it is the Derringer family crest. <laughs> Little bird, bro, give me your letter. And it, it kind of releases the the envelope, and its eyes kind of fade, and you can see you can see that the this clockwork bird has shut down. Do we need to take a minute? Can we get the giggles out, please? <laughs> this is just what my character sounds like, okay? <laughs> he comes from the so, planet of Slam Zone! So you... That not helping. So you, you pick up this envelope and open it, I believe? I do. And it begins with, Dear Gustum. This is the part where you read the rest. Oh, I read the rest. <clears throat> yes. Dear Gusto, I hope you and May are doing well. I long for her lemon chocolate bars. I miss the sound of the two of you cooking and wish that music upon my ears daily. Please give May my best. I wish I was writing to inform you of my next visit. However, while you've been gone, I've ventured onto my greatest exploration yet. I went to Agos. I've been here many years, but I've discovered something extraordinary, something dangerous. I've neglected to share this with anyone outside of the Derringer family for fear that it getting out could cause Goron's next great calamity. Please make your way to Agos and then Prynith. Find your sister Vanessa at the Derringer Field Estate in Prynith. Our family crest is on the front of the building. You can't miss it. Vanessa will tell you more once you get there. I'm afraid someone is onto my discovery and following me. Hurry, son, with all the speed of the wind. Love, Dad. And so, how does how does Gustum approach this conversation or this this information with May? Well, I think we have to wait for the dinner rush to die down, and then afterwards, I will sit her down for our private dinner that we have after everyone else eats. And so you do. And so the, the dinner rush comes and goes, and it is the sound of laughter and joy and conversations and murmuring and dishes moving and the sound of plates on tables and the running of the water and the scrubbing. It sounds... It, it, is, it is heaven for you two. It is an orchestra of your lives. And you do well. And tonight is a better night than most, Steve. And you're even getting a little more business than Teresa, which is, like, not something you guys often do. um, But it is always nice when that happens. And so you guys are sitting down at the end, having just put up the chairs and finished cleaning up after cooking your private meal. And what do the two of you eat? Uh, it's not, it's not even like a private meal separate. It's just, it's just like leftovers, the leftovers really. I mean, we're, we're not going to cook a whole new meal after we spent all day cooking. And so you do, and, and you're sharing this meal over wine or anything else. Uh, yeah, we, we, uh, I, I break out a, a, a nicer wine from our stores to, just to kind of ease the, get the ball rolling. Yeah. You look nervous, Custom. What? What's? Is everything okay? Uh, yeah, mate. Um, I got a letter today. Uh, from my dad. <laughs> and she's like eating, and she kind of looks up a little interested. Uh, is he doing well? <laughs> what has he gotten into? Uh, well, he went to uh, that new continent uh, they discovered, Agos. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, 
he's he's asked me to join him there. Uh, apparently, uh, he's made some kind of discovery, and he thinks uh, it could be dangerous. And you need to go? Why not Kato or one of the others? A little more suited for that kind of thing. I guess it's kind of like an all-hands-on-deck kind of thing, you know? Hmm. Well, how do you feel about this? Ah. I can't imagine leaving you behind. Do you want... But my family needs me also. Hmm. And she's kind of, you can see this like wave of sadness kind of flash over her. And then, and then you see, well, if you must go, I, I wouldn't want anything bad to happen to your dad. I love him like he was a father of my own. However, I do have one condition. Okay. You must write me every day. I want to know exactly what you're eating. That place is supposed to have all new walks of life. I, if I can't eat it myself, I must know. I could do that. You have to promise to be careful. I could do that too. Hmm. And I could promise to uh, love you, and I could promise to miss you every day. And she like laughs and giggles. She can see what you're doing. It's going to be okay. I know that. Declan wouldn't have you come into something if he thought you were going to get hurt. Well, hopefully you won't be gone too long. I, I hear that's pretty far away, but we'll manage here. I kind of wish, you know, uh, Teresa was still around. Me too. You kind of see her tearing up a little bit, and she kind of she takes her napkin and wipes it. Are you going to be okay without me? <laughs> yeah, uh, of course. I will be fine. It's just, it's a lot, you know. I, we had such a good night out. I, I wasn't expecting to end it with parting. When we- well, you know, the night's still young. We got lots of this fancy wine left. <sighs> so we do. And I think we, I think we the we the outer view it starts to begin to pull out and we watch may and gustum as they share a meal together and wine and they laugh and and the last scene we see of them is the two smiling over a table and this mill and i think we flash to a reluctant parting of gustum and may like a hug and embrace and then Gustum is begins uh, loading up a wagon and I think that's where we'll end this episode One. Yeah, what's up, man? One. Yep. Mm -hmm. Thank you for having an interesting backstory and letting me join on this experience. Uh, Also, date you. (laughs) That's always fun. Uh, I I love to date you. That's my thing. Two. uh, I apologize to uh, the cast and crew. A combination of Shane's voice catching me 100% off guard and the patron chat not helping. (laughs) 
I could not compose myself quickly enough, so that is my bust. My bad, Shane. Because, Shane, you were doing some very <laughs> good things, and I, my face was coming apart, and you were like, dude, I'm just... I saw it in your face. <laughs> oh, please, I'm trying. But it was the, I, and I tried to collect myself, but it's funny. the patron it's chat was killing me. Um, I could have warned you. No, it's okay. It's funnier. This is the podcast, and I'm going to use this as a good selling point. Hey, if you don't know this, you can be a $50 patron. Uh, I think all the slots are full right now, but keep an eye out on it. Um, so you can actually listen to these things live and chat with us and do what you they did tonight, which is break me fucking apart. All right, we are coming into C4 any minute now. So, Shane, we love you. Bye. We love you. Bye. Bye.